Well, well, the news I'm going to give you today is certainly very joyous, very positive. But before I get into today's announcement about the Department of Education, I want to address the tragedy that occurred just a little while ago in Park Slope. And for Shalane and I, obviously, this is very personal. This occurred in our neighborhood, very, very close to our home. Here's what we know so far. A driver struck a group of pedestrians, a family, at the intersection of Fifth Avenue and Ninth Street. There were five victims transported to the hospital. I'm very sad to say that two ha were pronounced dead upon arrival, and both were young children. Uh, it's really, really sad what happened uh, today. And three other victims that, thank God, have non-life-threatening injuries are now in the hospital. Uh, the driver is in NYPD custody. Uh, we do not know exactly what happened yet. There's a full investigation underway. Um, but I will state the obvious. This, this loss of life is tragic and painful for all of us, particularly those of us who are parents. Uh, but it's another reminder of why we have to redouble our efforts on Vision Zero uh, to work to the day when this never happens to any family. Um, this is a, an intersection, again, we know very, very well. We have crossed it many times with Dante and Chiara when they were kids, so this is personal. And we are praying for uh, the families who have gone through this tragedy, and we, we will do everything we can to help them. So, as I said, despite that very painful moment, what we have to announce is something really wonderful. And uh, I think everyone here knows nothing is more important to me than the future of our schools and the needs of our kids. And this is a passion uh, for Charlene and I in this work. Uh, and we have felt such a strong commitment to making sure that our school system, the biggest in the country by far, 1.1 million kids, the flagship school system in the nation, we have been focused on making sure we had the best leader. Uh, I want to thank Sherlane for the many, many hours she has put into this effort. I want to thank First Deputy Mayor Dean Fulohan as well. Uh, the three of us acted as a team. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into uh, some of the conversations over the last few days. But suffice it to say, we've had many, many conversations with Richard and several meals together in the last 48 hours. And I want to thank Charlene and Dean for all the energy they put into this process. Let me tell you about Richard Carranza. And I want to tell you his story is the story of the American dream, if ever there was one. His grandparents came to the United States from Mexico, settled in Tucson, Arizona. His parents, working class Americans, hard working people. His dad, a sheet metal worker, his mom, a hairdresser. Uh, humble origins, but they believed in education. They also were very, very proud of who they were and their heritage. And Richard grew up speaking Spanish at home and learned English for the first time in public school. Now, Richard, I didn't say this to you before, but I'm going to give you the highest compliment I could possibly give you because the person in my life who went through that exact same experience was my mother, Maria. And she was the child of immigrants, but she was born here, but never spoke English until she walked into a school building for the first time. And, and she turned out pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so I have a special feeling uh, for English language learners. But what's so beautiful about uh, Richard's story is from the moment he started to experience our public schools, in this case in Tucson, he blossomed, he was off to a great, great future. Richard, in everything he's done, has been devoted to children, and he has been a change agent through his work. And you'll hear when he speaks how much he has a profound understanding of the work of education and what it can do to change the lives of kids, and how much we have to keep changing the way we educate to create a fairer society. He did this work in Tucson, he did this work in Las Vegas, in San Francisco, and then most recently in Houston. He has been a teacher, for many years was a teacher, a principal, an administrator, and 
a superintendent of two of the most prominent school systems in America. What we saw in San Francisco, in San Francisco, Richard was the uh, deputy superintendent uh, for uh, three years and then the superintendent for four more, so seven years continuous. And what we saw in San Francisco was remarkable as we were doing our research. And I talked to a number of people in San Francisco who had worked closely with Richard, and, and the response was uniformly positive. The beliefs he brings to this work played out very deeply in San Francisco. His focus was on increasing equity. His focus was overcoming the divisions of the past, at the same time creating uh, academic rigor. In San Francisco, graduation rates uh, increased substantially on Richard's watch. Test scores increased substantially compared to other uh, cities in California. Uh, he also did a very impressive job of working to close the achievement gap. And a lot of the biggest increases in test scores were among Latino and African American students, including many of whom were low income. So he's had a proven record as someone who can get results while moving an equity agenda, and that certainly is so powerful to us when we think about our core vision of equity and excellence. When he went on to Houston, he knew he was going into a very tough situation, uh, a school district that had been historically underfunded. I will say this gently, a state government that perhaps did not invest all it could have in education. Uh, Richard went into a tough situation with that same uh, equity agenda for Houston. And uh, he was just getting into the work when uh, the worst natural disaster in the history of Houston struck with Hurricane Harvey. When you look at uh, Richard Carranza's leadership in Houston during Hurricane Harvey, you see extraordinary strength. Uh, an amazing ability to stay calm despite the magnitude of the crisis. Uh, he is one of the people who helped get Houston back on its feet. And he determined very early on that the school district had to lead the way. And audaciously determined that schools would reopen two weeks after the disaster. Again, we all saw the footage from Houston. It was devastating, the worst flooding the city had ever known. But Richard Carranza said, we can't become whole again unless our schools are working. And for so many families, unless the schools were working, the rest of their lives wouldn't be working. So he got those schools up and running. And he also determined that the schools would be a source of help and support for families in all neighborhoods. So he made sure the kids could get three meals a day in those schools in the midst of that crisis. He made sure that if family members needed meals, they could come to the schools and get them because he knew that he, as a leader, had an opportunity to serve and to get something done because of the sheer magnitude of the school district. He could get something done for Houston that very few others could. He also did a great job of bringing in outside support and outside resources to help the children of Houston during that crisis. So I want to commend him for those extraordinary achievements. I also want to say, as a man who has shown a lot of courage as a leader, uh, let's face it, going to the state of Texas means you're going to hit some political headwinds for sure. But Richard Carranza said the same things in Houston, Texas that he said in San Francisco, California. He stood up for the rights of LGBT students. He stood up for the rights of transgender students. He believed every child deserved a, a great education regardless of what zip code they lived in. And that's the way he has lived wherever he's been. I will tell you that um, I've heard his passion, and I've talked to people who served with him. He is an educator's educator. And I know that the extraordinary men and women who work for the Department of Education will quickly sense that he is a kindred soul and someone who's walked a mile in their shoes. And he's someone who understands our children and our parents. When you think about his life and the life of his family, this is someone who every day will relate to the kids he serves and will be able to communicate with the parents who care so deeply about their children's future. And that gives me tremendous confidence. Let me say a few words in Spanish. My Spanish will not be as good as Richard's Spanish, <laughs> or Carmen's Spanish for that matter, or Shirlane's Spanish, but I'm going to try anyway. <clears throat> Monique, you too. So basically, I <clears throat> can't compete with anyone here. Oi. Estamos anunciando que Richard Carranza será nuestro nuevo 
Okay, no, that was Italian, sorry. Nuevo. <laughs> it happens sometimes. <laughs> Hoy estamos anunciando que Richard Garanza será nuestro nuevo canciller escolar. Richard comparte una experiencia de vida similar a la de muchos neoyorquinos y ha demostrado que puede construir un sistema escolar para todos los estudiantes, sin importar su origen o condición. Richard también encarna nuestra visión de equidad y excelencia y luchará para crear una Nueva York más justa para todos. With that, I want to turn to our First Lady. I want to thank her for her deep involvement in this process and for asking all the right questions and helping us get to this day. Sherlane. Thank you, Bill. I am delighted to welcome Richard Carranza as our new school's chancellor. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. We're so excited for him to bring his experience, expertise, and energy to New York City with a proven record of leadership and success in Houston, San Francisco, and Las Vegas, and a tremendous warmth that will help him connect with students, parents, and teachers alike, Richard is uniquely well positioned to build on the progress that we have made here. In many ways, the hallmark of Richard's long career as an educator is his holistic understanding of how children learn. That is so important in New York City, where 1.1 million school children of all different backgrounds and experiences come together to learn and to grow. In San Francisco, he helped add social and emotional metrics to the new district accountability system and valued restorative approaches to student behavior issues. In Houston, he has worked to strengthen social and emotional supports in underachieving schools, bringing on more nurses and social workers and partnering with community agencies to serve struggling families. Because Richard understands that schools are so much more than just buildings. They are the heart of our communities, a vital resource, and a bridge to opportunity, support, and wellness. And not just for students, but their families as well. That's why when the disaster hit Houston last year in the form of Hurricane Harvey, Richard acted decisively and collaboratively to get the schools up and running right away. He knew that schools would help families and communities recover more quickly. And by providing crisis and trauma training to staff, he made sure that Houston's teachers were better equipped to help children navigate the long-lasting and often hidden effects of devastation. Needless to say, he has a deep understanding and unbridled enthusiasm for what we're doing here with Thrive NYC. <laughs> he will be an excellent partner as we fully integrate behavioral health services into our schools. As he has said before, Richard is not interested in system improvement. He's interested in system change. And he understands on a fundamental level that here in New York City, the vibrant diversity of our school communities is our greatest strength and love and compassion are our greatest tools. That's why he has been a lifelong champion for the most vulnerable children under his care, including LGBTQ students, immigrants, students with disabilities and mental illness, and victims of bullying. It's why he has consistently elevated women and people of color to senior leadership positions and promoted opportunities for all different kinds of learners, including those who are learning English in school, as he did. All of this makes Richard the ideal successor for Chancellor Farina, a public service powerhouse whose career has been defined by a love of learning and deep compassion for all of New York City's students. She has led with love throughout her entire career, touching countless lives along the way and building a legacy that is well worth building upon. One of the many qualities that makes Carmen so effective is that she is a storyteller with purpose. And that is Richard as well. He understands the power of story well told. He understands the power of a story well told, well told, or a song well sung. Perhaps because of how his own story, living the American dream, has shaped him so profoundly. En español, nuestro nuevo canciller Richard Acosta Carranza entiende que las escuelas son el corazón de nuestras comunidades. Tiene tiene un historial, historial probado de 
liderazgo. You made me nervous. I know. <laughs> oh. Liderazgo y éxito en educación. Y sí, sí, sé que será un verdadero campeón para los niños de la ciudad de New York, sus familias y todas las todas nuestras comunidades. Richard likes to describe himself as a man of action, someone who does not spend time admiring the problem. I share his sense of urgency as we look ahead to the coming years for New York City public schools. And I look forward to working closely with him to help all of New York City's children and their families to thrive. Thank you for sharing. Very lovely. Um, I now have the opportunity to introduce the chancellor. And uh, I've introduced Carmen Farina many times. We were, we were comparing notes earlier since we first met in 2001. And this is going to be one of the last times I get to do it while you're working for the government, although I have a feeling I'll see you even after you're working for the government. I certainly hope so. <laughs> but I love talking about her 50-plus years in education, even though she doesn't like it when I do it. I continue to do it because it's extraordinary. Uh, our Chancellor, Carmen Farina, has lived a life of profound service to the children of this city. Uh, there was uh, a day when I talked to her shortly after the election in 2013, and she told me she was not interested in the role. And then there was a very good day when she told me she reconsidered. And that led us to spend over four great years together. And I got to tell you, <clears throat> at the end of this good run, Chancellor, you got a lot to be proud of. And uh, our parents and our kids got to see your heart in your work every single day. And I heard it from them all the time. I even heard it from elected officials, uh, how much, <clears throat> excuse me, how much they understood your passion for the work and they saw the changes you were making and what an impact it made. So. So maybe one of the last times I get to formally introduce you, but your legacy will surely live on for many, many years. Our Chancellor, Carmen Farina. Well, thank you. I couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, when you work this hard at something, you want to make sure you're bequeathing what you've done to someone who's like-minded. And as I've had conversations with Richard over the last few days, we started talking about our personal life. And every time he said something, I said, check. We're similar. <laughs> Check. We're similar. Not only were we both uh, non-English speakers, uh, our families were laborers, and they came to this understanding that working with your hands is not a bad thing if that's what you had to do to earn a living for your family. He's also a social studies buff, and I said, oh, my God, check. Um, he said, really understands that dual language is the way for many of our children to speak two languages, not to make up just a, something else. But there's something else that I think is very important that I just really kind of discovered today. I met his wife, Monique, and if there's anything I have to say about this job or any job at this level, that if you don't have someone along your side who shares your enthusiasms, who understands what you're going through, you're really not going to be able to do this job. I've been fortunate to have a man in my life, as much as he says, what time are you getting home today? Three o'clock in the morning? Um, I think Monique understands that is embracing it. And I think also, when you hear the passion in both of them for this city, you have to love New York City to do well here. You really have to want to be in New York City. You want it. We talked Brooklyn, right, guys? I, I offered to help them find an apartment. Not, not, nothing in interest, but just because I want them to love Brooklyn as much as I do. He's an educator's educator. He's nationally recognized by Education Week as a leader to learn from. But in my conversations with him, I also understand that he knows he has a lot to learn. The one thing I have to say about my last four years, I have learned so much more than I knew before. And we have to go into this job as a learner as well as a teacher. Um, Richard kept using the words over and over again, this is what's good for the kids. That's what this job is all about. It's about the kids. Then he kept sticking in. Well, you know, the parents have to be involved, too. They have to know what their responsibilities are and what the kids need. So um, empowering parents, making the best principles possible, uh, being innovative. I mean, one of the things many of you have asked, and certainly I've considered, there's a lot of work to be done in New York City. No matter how much we did, it's never going to be enough. And a lot of the things that I feel could go deeper are things that he's passionate about as well. 
So um, I also asked him, could I keep a little bit of my job? And he said, anything you want. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm yet leaving the stage. I, when I talk about retirement this time, it's going to stick. Um, but if there's anything I can do to be a mentor or give advice, I'm open for it. But what I can say, honestly, I can really go um, and spend a vacation and really feel comfortable that I'm leaving the most difficult job other than the mayor's in the most capable hands um, that I can imagine. And I'm really, really thrilled that he's going to be the chancellor. So there'll be two chances simultaneously for a while. Yeah. Um, but it's OK with me if it's OK <laughs> with you. You're forgetting something in español. Um, es mi placer hoy presentaros a uh, el canciller que me va a uh, seguir. Y Richard Caranza uh, viene de enseñanza en varios sitios, pero la cosa más importante que darse cuenta es que él tiene muchísimo interés que todos los alumnos de la ciudad de Nueva York que sigan más adelante y que los padres sean parte de esa conversación y seguir escuchándolos. Y como hablo español también, muchos padres van a poder hablar con él en español. Y eso para mí es bastante importante, pero es más importante que él pueda decir lo que yo quiero es lo que es mejor para, para sus hijos. Y hoy conocí por primera vez su esposa, que también está muy contenta de venir a vivir en Nueva York y también ayudar, porque todas las personas que tienen estas responsabilidades necesitan ayuda cuando vienen para casa y pueden hablar con alguien sobre lo que está pasando. So, es mi placer tener a Richard Caranza aquí hoy, anunciando que va a ser el canciller nuevo. Muchas gracias. De nada. So, I just want to say, as I introduce Richard, uh, the central mission, we talked about this on Inauguration Day and we talked about it, the state of the city, the central mission is to make this the fairest big city in America. Uh, one of the most essential parts of this mission is to make our schools work for all our children, again, regardless of zip code. If you want to summarize the pillar of uh, education when it comes to making this the fairest big city in America. It is what equity and excellence is all about. Every child having opportunity, no child being left out because of who they are or where they come from. And that's what I wanted to see in our next chancellor, and I'm proud to say we found him. So ladies and gentlemen, the next chancellor of the New York City Public Schools, Richard Carranza. So thank you, Mayor de Blasio, uh, for that in introduction. I also want to thank you, First Lady McRae, for your words, and to uh, one of my educational heroes, uh, Chancellor Farinha, uh, for what uh, you shared with us today. I, I guess for a little while, I'm going to be the spare chancellor. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm the spare one. Everything's equal around here. <laughs> and, and obviously, I'm very honored to be uh, joined by my life partner, my wife, Monique. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to share a few words with with you this this afternoon and, and just express how incredibly honored I am. Uh, the son of a journeyman sheet metal worker and a hairdresser from uh, a barrio in Tucson, Arizona, uh, who by all accounts should be somewhere in Tucson right now installing sheet metal because that's what my dad did. Yet. It was because of these two non-college educated parents who had no idea what financial aid was about, had no idea what enrolling in a university was about, had no idea about what a course of study was about, but knew that for their boys, uh, their twin sons, that the path forward had to include an education. Uh, so I know that across this incredible city, the city of Candours, Mm. New York City, that there are thousands upon thousands of parents who have the same aspirations that Simon and Dolores Carranza had for their twin boys. So it is in that spirit that I share with you and uh, aligned with the best traditions of my culture where you honor your antepasados, you honor, you honor those that came before you. I want to uh, again thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for this opportunity uh, to serve uh, the 1.1 million children who are the children of the New York City Public Schools. With that said, my trajectory has always been that of a teacher. I consider myself a teacher now. 
Uh, where I used to work with children in classrooms, I now work with adults in bigger environments. And I still make it a point every week to visit classrooms. That's where I find my inspiration. That's where I find my strength. And quite frankly, that's where I find uh, the good things that are happening as we think about educating our children. But make no mistake, my friends, education is the cornerstone of our democracy. It is the great equalizer. It is a great empowerer of the next generation. And right now, as we speak, the 1.1 million children in New York are the future taxpayers of New York. They are the future doctors and lawyers and teachers. They are the future mayors. They are the future of this vibrant city, which is like no other in the United States. So it is a great honor that we have every day to serve those children in the best way that we can. Now, I will tell you that. I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to my school board in Houston, Texas, who gave me an opportunity to come to Houston and serve. I owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to Mayor Sylvester Turner in Houston, who was a true partner. Uh, and I want to thank them for the opportunity. But just as I one day longed to serve more than the 30 students in my classroom and, and serve a school full of students as a principal, and then longed to have an impact on more than just one school of children, but a district of children, uh, I stand before you here, uh, or sit before you here, with no greater opportunity than the largest school system in America, in the greatest city in America, the most diverse city in America, New York City. So I don't take that lightly, uh, but I take that with every ounce of conviction that the equity agenda uh, championed by our mayor is my equity agenda. And when I considered uh, this opportunity, uh, there is no daylight between Mayor de Blasio and myself in terms of what we believe in, what our aspirations are for the children of New York City. Uh, so I think when you have that kind of synergy, it makes sense. Uh, and that's what I hope to be part of this team that will uh, continue to empower teachers as Chancellor Farina has done, continue to uh, talk about not arming teachers with anything but great professional development mm -hmm. and great opportunities uh, to move within the system to serve other students and many students. Uh, I hope to move the conversation so that we're not talking about bathrooms and we're talking about classrooms. Uh, I hope to be part of the solution and part of the innovation that has started, that is gaining momentum, and that we can actually accelerate what we're doing in New York City. But I do have a message directly for the children of New York City. If you're a student who does not yet speak English, we hear you. If you're a dreamer, we hear you. If you are formally or formal, formerly not being served, we will serve you. And if you are parents, we are going to take care of your children as if you are take care, taking care of them yourselves. Uh, that is our mission, that is what we're here for, and I am very honored to follow a great chancellor, but more importantly, to work with a great mayor in America's largest city. Para los que hablan español en nuestra comunidad, simple y sencillamente es un honor, es un gran honor, siendo el hijo de dos padres que no fueron al colegio, que no nunca supieron qué es asistir a colegio, pero sin embargo y no obstante, sabían que el privilegio, el camino hacia el éxito para sus hijos era el colegio. Entonces para mí es un gran honor estar aquí en Nueva York trabajando con este alcalde que tiene una agenda de equidad que no, no tiene igualdad. Es un honor estar aquí siguiendo un casillera que ha hecho un trabajo maravilloso para empoderar a nuestros maestros, empoderar a nuestras comunidades, para que sean las comunidades que tengan todos los beneficios para nuestros estudiantes en esta ciudad. Y sin embargo, también es un, es un honor estar aquí para hablar con la comunidad, trabajar con la comunidad y seguir adelante todos los buenos hechos que se han llevado a cabo en esta ciudad de Nueva York. Pero un mensaje para los estudiantes directamente que nos estén escuchando o que me estén escuchando. Si tú eres un estudiante que no hablas inglés, aquí estamos para ayudarte. Te reconocemos y te vamos a apoyar. Si eres un estudiante que eres soñador, 
No le hagas caso a lo que otros digan que no perteneces aquí, porque tú el sueño que tienes es el sueño de este país. Y aquí te vamos a apoyar, te queremos dar el bienestar y contamos que se queden aquí para que sean parte del futuro de esta gran ciudad. Y para los padres de familia que me estén escuchando, queden seguros que nosotros vamos a cuidar, vamos a apoyar y les vamos a enseñar el camino, el camino hacia el éxito con su ayuda y su apoyo a sus hijos. Haz de cuenta que son los nuestros. Y para mis colegas que son maestros o maestros, directores en todos los niveles de este distrito escolar, me da gran honor de ser uno de ustedes, uno que empezó su carrera en los salones, en una aula, como maestro casi una década. Y les juro que jamás se me va a olvidar de dónde vengo, porque juntos, unidos, podemos tener el éxito hacia el futuro. So with that, very happy to be here, Mr. Mayor, and happy to answer any questions we may have. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Bien hecho. Muchas gracias. <laughs> okay. Who has chance questions for the new chancellor? Go ahead. Um, wondering, you know, we all know that there was someone else who was supposed to take this job and made a decision not to. Can you sort of speak to your decision-making process? Was this a hard decision for you? Did you struggle with it? Or was it kind of an easy one? And uh, secondly, uh, what will the new chancellor's salary be? The chancellor's salary will be the same as his base pay in Houston. Uh, the decision was straightforward. Uh, Richard Carranza has done amazing work. And I will give you this much of the uh, play out of the last few days because I think it speaks volumes. The, on uh, Wednesday afternoon last week, I called Richard Kranz and I said, look, we had a great process with you. This has gone on for weeks. We, we first made contact well over a month ago. I said we had a great process with you. But it came down to two people, and we made a different choice. But I told him how much I admired him, how much I was impressed. I said it was a very tough choice. And I said, Richard, I really like you, and I hope our paths will cross again someday. Uh, 24 hours later, <laughs> I did not know I could predict things that quickly. That's quite amazing. Man of your word. Man yeah. Man of your yeah. word. I really called that one. 24 hours later, I was on the phone with Richard Carranza. Um, as soon as things uh, changed, I immediately reached out to Richard. I said, well, someday is today. Uh, want to re-engage you immediately. He agreed. This was about 5 o'clock on Thursday. I said, how soon can you be in New York? He said, I'll be there by Saturday. He came in uh, around noon on Saturday, and we spent all of Saturday and all of Sunday uh, in, in intensive discussions along with uh, Sherlane and Dean, and a very, very fruitful discussions. We covered everything and anything. And it was obviously important uh, to have uh, Richard talk to Carmen, and they had a great conversation uh, by phone, and Carmen was uh, strongly, uh, after that, urging me to go ahead. And uh, we felt very, very confident, uh, again, after probably, if I'm counting, you know, well over 12 hours of discussion. And uh, I made an offer uh, 10 o'clock last night uh, and sitting at the dining room table at Gracie Mansion, and uh, Richard agreed immediately. And uh, here we are. And I, I just want to emphasize one point that uh, Richard made. Um, he was hired by the school board uh, down in Houston. It's, that's how their system runs. They don't have mayoral control education. But he had a tremendously close working relationship with Mayor uh, Sylvester Turner in Houston. I had, a, I had a very powerful conversation with Mayor Turner a few hours ago. I, and although he was uh, obviously uh, saddened that uh, Richard was uh, coming here, he understood fully. He was very professional and very uh, understanding. But, but he immediately wanted me to know what a good man Richard Carranza is and how positive a working relationship they had and what an uh, honest and consistent uh, person he is, what an what a extraordinary public servant he is. And that was very important to hear from my uh, fellow mayor. So that's exactly how it went down, but it, it was uh, this close to automatic that the, the first thing I did was reach out to Richard. Go ahead. Just to ask you that, the question 
Well, I, I think when yeah, I've been a admirer of uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, since he was first elected and what he's talked about his equity uh, agenda and what he has talked about in terms of education is part you cannot have a world-class city without a world-class public education system and many times we admire uh, the issue or we will talk about the issue uh, but there are very few times where you actually put resources and you actually put effort and uh, a mayor has in every one of his comments uh, something about how important education is and uh, you have a mayor here in New York uh, that walks the talk uh, so for me when I when it was, there was an opportunity to have a conversation about education uh, and I actually got to sit across the table from him and have the conversation and have a and, and and have and have a a robust conversation about various topics quickly realize that we are synergistically on the same page uh, in many respects but especially as it pertains to empowering and, and equity for communities uh, so when the conversations became real um, and uh, the offer was made uh, it it was uh, very easy for me to say absolutely I'd I would like to be part of this movement that is happening in New York City to empower uh, through an equity lens all of our different communities. Um, you know, there was a question that was asked as well about, um, you know, why now and and how did you know and I, I will just say this to you I am who I am and I my brother and I had the incredible opportunity to be with my father when he passed away and the three things that my father said to my brother and I were number one take care of each other uh, number two take care of your mother uh, and number three he said the only thing I have to leave you is our name uh, so don't spoil that name for anyone so when uh, Mayor de Blasio extended his hand and said, uh, I'd like for you to be the next chancellor of schools in New York City. And he, we shook hands. That handshake is more powerful than any contract. Uh, that's my name. That's my word. And uh, I promised him that we will work tirelessly uh, to make the equity agenda real for all students in New York. Amen. Okay, I saw a hand. Melissa. Mr. Mayor, given that um, Mr. Carranza was already your runner-up for the job the first time, what was it that you were trying to confirm this past weekend, spending so many hours with him? Was it just trying to make sure he wasn't going to back out? I'm only kidding. It's, uh, this was about the kind of conversation that you have when you're talking about working together for four years. And um, everything I had seen previously I liked. But I wanted to go issue by issue. I wanted to understand what had happened over the last four years and, and how it informed what we we're going to do going forward. I wanted him to understand the challenges. Um, I really wanted to make sure we were fully aligned. And um, I thought it was a fantastic conversation. It was one of those conversations with each passing hour, I, I grew more and more confident. So. Uh, you know, I think uh, everything happens for a reason in life, and I feel uh, that we've ended up in a very, very good place. Marsha. Mr. Mayor, with all due respect to the Chancellor, I wondered if you thought that there was anybody in the Department of Education you could have promoted to, to further your equity agenda, much as you promoted James O'Neill to the place of Michelle Webb. Very fair question, Marsha, and I certainly thought about that. And I told you we had a nationwide search, and I mean a nationwide search. We looked at many dozens of candidates over the last few months and talked extensively to experts around the country. And of course, we looked at people uh, in the DOE now. We looked at people who had been in the DOE. Uh, but in terms of what I wanted, uh, the kind of ability to move the equity and excellence agenda, and the ability to play at this level. I mean, this is a grueling, grueling job being chancellor of this school system. And I, I always say to Carmen Freeney, I don't know what you eat for breakfast in the morning, but I want to eat it too. I don't know how she's always found the uh, energy she has. But to do this day in and day out, you have to be a very, very special talent. You have to have tremendous energy, tremendous commitment. And uh, to me, when I looked around, I saw that in Richard. I saw the uh, ability he had to succeed in city after city. Very important indicator of the ability to bring success here. 
but it just comes down to evaluating who can put all the pieces together. I mean, Marsha, this is an incredibly complex job being chancellor of the biggest school system in the country. And very few people, I think, have the ability to put all the pieces together. And Carmen Farina was one of them. And Richard Carranza is going to be the next. Yes. Um, can I first ask a comment and question on that? Um, when you say there's going to be two chancellors, what does that mean? Like, when are you leaving? Is this the kind of side project you did actually before you came out of retirement? Can I start for clarification and pass to Chancellor? This is, I don't want you to misunderstand from the beginning. Chancellor's on board till the end of the month, end of March. We are working out the exact start date for the new chancellor. Some details have to be wrapped up in Houston. So they may overlap a little bit. We certainly wanted to leave room for that. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's that's basically it. But, um, you know, because I, I really care about this job so much, there's one little project that I started, which is the co-located high school campuses, that I'd like to stay involved in. It's, it's, it's a little piece of the pie, but we've had so many good results with 25 campuses, 154 schools, that I asked Richard, would he mind if I stayed involved in that little work? And he said it would be his pleasure. So. Absolutely. That's the only project I expect to be involved in. I was going to ask the new chancellor, you've had experience in urban school districts, but obviously New York is in a league of its own. You don't know New York. Your predecessor knows New York schools quite well. How are you planning to, A, actually learn about these 800 schools with 1.1 million kids and then actually transform the schools to make them fair for everyone? We have more than 800 schools. Yes. Well, sorry. Carmen has been to 800. There are 1,800. Correct. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, uh, again, uh, I am who I am, and one of the things that I was taught uh, fr from from infancy almost is that you respect those that have come before you. So I'm incredibly honored that uh, that Chancellor Farina uh, not only is going to, but wants to be part as as of my transition and helping me to understand uh, what has happened and why has it happened and why is there a reason. I think that's an invaluable opportunity that, quite frankly, in many transitions of large systems, you don't get that opportunity. That being said, when you look at uh, public education in America, and especially in urban environments, uh, there are some similarities uh, that exist across the country. Uh, so everyone talks about graduation rates, but do we always talk about college persistence rates? And how does that relate to what you do in schools? Uh, equity is an issue. Thank you. 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 Uh, when you look at schools that by whatever metrics are quote unquote underperforming, and that's one of the last times you'll hear me use that term in reference to schools, uh, my experience has been, again now in four different states and four different school systems, that the schools don't just decide that they're going to be <laughs> underperforming. There are issues, there are situations, there are structural inequities that lead to underperformance. So I refer to schools as historically underserved. Because schools that are historically underserved, uh, if you um, buy the proposition that if they're underserved, then we, if we're a system, can choose to actually serve them. Uh, that is common in terms of how you support schools. What are the systems and structures? I think what also is incredibly important here in New York City and part of the work that uh, I've been able to be part of in my history is really looking at social emotional learning and the mental social well-being of students uh, in schools and quite frankly the adults that serve uh, our students in schools. We know that the, by the very nature of uh, living in an urban environment, uh, there are some modicum of uh, trauma or stress that students undergo. Yet in the past, perhaps, it wasn't recognized as a legitimate part of educating students. What I love about what's happening in New York, and uh, I know that the First Lady, uh, her visionary work with the Thrive Movement here in New York, uh, is, is, is actually setting the pace for what's happening across America. So imagine that if we can ensure that students are emotionally and mentally healthy while they're also being rigorously challenged uh, to develop academic press, uh, and we wrap that around with really great uh, fine arts and opportunities to enrich, uh, I think that's the kind of student that we want to graduate from our schools and be a, uh, a resident of, of New York. So those things are just incredibly 
incredibly, incredibly attractive uh, to me because they go to the core of who I am as an educator. Uh, but those are also issues that are prevalent across other large urban environments. So I think there's a lot that can be brought to New York. But that being said, there is only one New York, una gran manzana, and that's just <laughs> New York right here. <laughs> Excellent, David. And just to follow up on that, I wanted to ask how much time you've actually spent in New York City and where you've gone, where you plan on living. Yeah, so uh, again, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna pick uh, uh, Chancellor Farina's uh, brain about uh, good places to live. Obviously, there's a lot to do, um, and I also want to mention the mayor has mentioned this as well. Uh, I still have some responsibilities to uh, fulfill in Houston, uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to getting back there and working with my board to plan when those exact dates are going to are going to look like. Um, I have to say that uh, Monique has spent much more time in New York because of her professional activities than I have, uh, but I will tell you the time that I've been in New York, I've absolutely enjoyed uh, not necessarily going to the tourist places, but just getting to know how the city feels and how it how it's organized and where where the neighborhood or the boroughs. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know the city and making this city mine. Okay. Louis. Por favor, canciller, háblenos de su pasión por la música y si alguna vez cantó por el alcalde y qué fue la canción que le cantó. Mira nomás. <laughs> qué preguntita me está dando. Uh, pues desde niño, desde niño, pues mi papá tocaba la guitarra y pues yo... Queriendo estar con él de niño, me, me decía, pues la única manera de que no tienes que ir a dormir es que todo el mundo que esté a, despierto tiene que tocar un instrumento. Entonces, pues me puse a aprender la guitarra. Pero yo he sido mariachi, músico mariachi desde niño. Y además de eso, pues también tocaba el saxofón en la banda, pero la música de mariachi es lo que me capturó el alma y desde entonces sigo tocando la música de mariachi. Uh, entonces, para mí es, es un gran orgullo poder interpretar la música vernácula de México. Sin embargo, de vez en cuando, pues tal vez hay un video ahí por, por YouTube en donde me han visto que me gusta cantar, si me invitan. Me gusta tocar un instrumento, si me invitan. Y si no me invitan, también canto y toco. Uh, en inglés. Yes, yes. That's good stuff. We want in English. So uh, the question the question was, uh, we understand that uh, you like music, and uh, we've heard rumors that every now and then you will play and sing. So uh, absolutely, uh, uh, since a child, my father was a guitar player, and, uh, you know, as a kid wanting to stay up with my dad and, his, and my uncles, and they would say the only people's gets to stay up are people playing instruments. You have to go to bed. Uh, so I learned to play guitar. And uh, I'm a mariachi musician, and I've been a mariachi musician since about the age of six. Uh, and I also played the saxophone in the band, but mariachi is where my passion has been. Worked my way through college gigging as a mariachi. And there may be a video or two that's uh, floating out there in, in, in the universe of me singing. And, you know, if I'm asked to sing, chances are I'm going to sing. Mm. If I'm asked to play, chances <laughs> are I'm going to play. And if I'm not asked to sing or play, chances are I'm going to sing and play. Uh, uh, so, and then the question was, have I ever sung for uh, the mayor? Um, and the answer is no. I've actually sung for the mayor and the first lady. Uh, and uh, when we, ha we crossed this topic, they said, uh, you really do sing. Uh, absolutely. Well, too bad we don't have a guitar. I said, Mr. Mayor, don't you worry. Uh, we'll do it a cappella. And the song that I dedicated to the first lady on behalf of the mayor was a song called Maria Elena. Uh, so uh, I sang it to him. I hope it was okay. It was fantastic. Some brownie points for you, Mr. Yes. Mayor? Great. I felt very special. But we're not going to do it here. We're going to give you a chance to have a separate debut. So, yes, I, I have two daughters. Uh, they don't live in New York. They don't live in Texas. Uh, my oldest daughter is a, a senior in college, and my other daughter uh, lives with her mom in Arizona. Okay, way back. Take this in a different direction, but um, what no, were we're only doing mariachi questions at this point. <laughs> what were the areas um, where there was the where, where there was a little bit of daylight? What, what were the areas in your conversations where you know you have something going in New York City and uh, you, uh, Chancellor, to to be Toronto were uh, you know that's not something you've done and not something you particularly thought um, you know was the right direction. What were the what were the areas of tension in the conversations? I'll start and say I don't think there was a lot of tension. I think there was a lot of alignment. Um, you know, I feel very urgent that we have to keep building on what we've done. And, and I feel that um, dynamic you feel when there is a term limit. 
um, that I, I think I can help me count here. We've got uh, three years, nine months, and 25 days or 24 days uh, to get a whole lot done. And uh, I feel urgency, so I want to see more and uh, take what Carmen Farina started and supercharge it and go as far as we possibly can. So to me, that was my question to Richard, you know, how much can we get done, how fast? Um, and the good news was that he shared a sense of urgency and had some real experience, uh, particularly in his time in San Francisco, in moving a change agenda at real intense speed. Um, that was, so it wasn't tension, but that was like the challenge, if you will, that we talked about. But philosophically, I don't think there was any uh, area of meaningful disagreement. I, I would second that. I think philosophically, we are completely aligned now. You know, I just got here. So as uh, you know, I kind of uh, lift the hood and look under the hood and, and, and really understand why is it we are doing certain things? Why is it that we're not doing certain things? And I get my hands around that. I think there's going to be more robust conversations about perhaps we take a little more divergent path or we stay on the course that we're on. Uh, but I do want to say it's important. And I think if there's one thing that uh, the mayor talk, uh, mayor and I talked and the first lady and I talked a, a lot about was, you know, how do we use data? to drive some of the decisions we're doing. But, and again, I want to be really careful about this. I am not ever advocating that we should have a testing culture. That's just anathema to, in my perspective, from my perspective, to educating the the whole child. But I do think that you need to have some, you need to have some indicators. You need to know and be able to have a pulse on how are you progressing. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to understanding how we do that here in New York. Uh, and as the mayor has said, there's a, there's a finite time. Uh, so we don't want to waste one minute of that to actually start accelerating and continue to accelerate uh, the great work that uh, Chancellor Farinha and her team have, have already begun here in New York. Yes. There's been a lot of, well, New York City is known as the most um, segregated racially and economically school system in the country, and there's been a lot of conversations in this room and outside of this room about how important that is um, and what the city can do about that and what the school's chancellor can do about that. Do you have any thoughts on tackling segregation from the position of school's chancellor and how much of a focus will that be for you? So, so again, I'm, I just got here, uh, but I can tell you that in every community that I lived and worked in, uh, segregation and integration are issues. Uh, it comes with living in large urban systems and what patterns of where people choose to live, uh, where they choose to uh, um, spend their time um, contributes to a lot of these types of issues. Uh, I firmly believe that it is not the school districts within the school districts purview in and of itself to actually solve some of those big issues. But I do think we have a conversation to have, and I do think that we have the opportunity to be part of a broader solution uh, that is actually much more citywide and city-based. Uh, I know that uh, Mayor de Blasio, in, in, in some of the conversations we've had, we've, we've touched upon that. And uh, I can't tell you, again, I just got here, but I can't tell you what that's going to look like, but I can tell you that if you're talking about access and equity for all students, you have to talk about all of the potential uh, artifacts that go with that kind of a conversation. And, and having an integrated um, school district, and quite frankly, uh, you talk about integrated school districts, you talk about integrated cities. Hmm. Uh, so it's a broader conversation than that, but uh, I know it fits within equity and access. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for this and welcome. And I'm wondering if I were a parent of a special needs person uh, or child, I might be concerned because there were big investigations in Texas and Houston that thousands of children were denied their special ed services for budget reasons or what have you. I know there was a lot of finger pointing with that in various directions, but can you help us understand why uh, parents of special needs children should, how they should be feeling about this and what you can do to make them feel comfortable? Sure. So thank you. So um, I'm going to I'm going to give context uh, by talking about California first. Uh, so when I arrived in California in San Francisco as a deputy superintendent, 
within two weeks of arriving in San Francisco, uh, I went to the superintendent and asked uh, to do a special education audit because my philosophy is that uh, all too many times uh, special education and students with disabilities, uh, we talk about special education as a program and it is not a program, it's a service. And the best environment, not only by law, but by best practice for a student with disabilities is in a mainstream classroom by and large. So how we build that capacity to give students the full array of access to the curriculum is incredibly important. And in that situation, uh, it was very evident that there was a programmed, a programmatic approach rather than a service approach. We, have, we absolutely revolutionized uh, or turned it upside down what we were doing in San Francisco. Uh, that was directly related to the work that I led in San Francisco. So I I would actually say to parents that I'm a, I'm a great champion of all students, but particularly students that um, don't always get the attention that they need. I think one of the other things that you have to look at when you're looking at uh, students with disabilities or students that are being categorized as students with disabilities is the over-identification of certain student groups. Again, in San Francisco, we noticed that Af Afri African American uh, male students were eight times more likely to be, to be identified as special education students. Uh, and either you believe that it's they're biologically, physiologically, genealogically special ed students, or it's the system that's actually not working in their behalf. We changed that. We were able to lower the over-identification and change that uh, aspect that was very problematic. Now, moving to Texas, uh, when I arrived in Texas, uh, almost upon my arrival in Texas, there was some great reporting that was done by a reporter with the Houston Chronicle, who I believe now is here in, in New York. Uh, and what he had found was that there was a systematic um, artificial cap that was at the state level. So in other words, the, the agency at the state level uh, was penalizing school districts if they uh, identified too many students with disabilities. Now, again, as a new superintendent in Texas and a fresh set of eyes. Uh, once uh, once uh, that was brought to my attention, we immediately acted. Uh, again, we called for a special education audit to come and give us some uh, third party professional um, insight to what was happening, but we didn't wait for that. We held community meetings with parents. I held community meetings as a superintendent with teachers of special education. And in those meetings, I didn't allow anyone else. It was a superintendent and teachers. So there was no, uh, no, no team. I wanted to hear from teachers. Uh, we had the meetings with parents, with principals. That informed some immediate changes that we made to programming, professional development, structuring, uh, and those reforms are ongoing right now in Houston. Uh, and most recently, the, the United States Department of Education Civil Rights has uh, issued some guidance to the state uh, department, the Texas Education Agency, around those issues that the state agency had uh, with artificial caps for, for school districts. So uh, in every one of those, uh, every one of those positions, I have championed the rights of, of students with disabilities, uh, really fought to empower parents, have clear processes. Uh, we've even hired um, ombuds persons so that parents uh, don't have to go get an advocate. They have somebody right on staff that can help them navigate the process. So I would say to parents in New York City that uh, in, in your new Chancellor, uh, as I know with, with uh, the current Chancellor, you have a champion for all students, including students with disabilities. Yeah. Over the weekend, you called for an outright ban on plastic bags. Let's do this one. I'm going to take other t questions uh, later on in the week, but let's do this now. Um, did you sign a contract with the city? I can answer that. No. We don't do contracts. Okay. So you didn't have to sign in blood or anything like that? No, we don't do blood either. <laughs> okay. Bridget. Uh, welcome, Chancellor Carranza. Um, you talked about how you make it a policy to go in visit classrooms, something that Chancellor Perina uh, beamed at when you said. I'm wondering, what is it that you look for when you're going into classrooms? What is, why do you do that, and what's, what are you trying to find out by doing that? Yeah, great question. So, uh, number one, it's for my mental health because uh, th that always is a safe spot for me. That's. That's where I originally started my career, so a classroom just feels comfortable. It feels where I should be. Uh, but number two, uh, you can read 
many reports. You can do a literature search about effective classrooms and effective schools. And it can all be very beautifully written, but until you walk over that threshold and actually feel the environment, and you feel how, how do adults interact with each other? How do adults interact with children? How do children interact with each other? What do you see on the walls? Uh, what do you see? How are you greeted when, when you come into a classroom? Are they cleanly? Is a school cleanly? Uh, do they have a sense of pride? When you talk to teachers, do they feel or do they have a sense that they're empowered and they have a voice in the decision making? What does the curriculum look like? Is it, you know, 1970s or is it cutting edge? And what are all of those things are probably reportable in a report, but they are absolutely front and center when you walk into a classroom. So for me, it's my mental health. But number two, it's for me, I, I get to I get to experience what that environment is in, in a school, and you can't do it uh, unless you're in a classroom. And I will tell you this, my motto is, one chancellor in the field is worth three in the seat. I, I guess I have to put a disclaimer, I did not rehearse them for that answer. Right. <laughs> that, Carmen, that is in the vein of great minds think alike. <laughs> Go ahead, Bridget, we'll follow up. Follow up. There has been some criticism from folks outside of um, education advocates who wanted to have more of a stake in this process, um, that this is the process that has played out. Uh, you're not new to a new place, so you've had to, you know, get the lay of the land. So how will you go about sort of understanding um, who's involved with the system and, you know, who feels like they're a stakeholder, who wants to have a say, um, potentially reaching out to some of those people who felt like they needed, should have had more of a say? Absolutely, great question. So uh, I've already mentioned that I'm, I'm going to tap uh, Chancellor Farina's uh, vast memory and, and Rolodex about uh, who does she know that uh, I should probably meet, be meeting with. I know May, Mayor de Blasio and the First Lady uh, and uh, the First uh, Vice Mayor have talked about as well a list of people that I'm going to go out and meet. Uh, but then I'm going to kind of guide my way as well. And, and I want I want to meet with, for example, I want to meet with parent groups. I want to meet with uh, uh, some of the stakeholder groups in the city of New York. Who they are, I will find out. But I also want to meet with the arts organizations. I am a huge believer in the integration of arts. You have to integrate, you have to educate the whole child. So I want to know who are the movers and shakers in New York City around arts education. I want to meet with philanthropy in, in New York City and talk to them about uh, not why should you be working with us, but why can you, how can you afford not to work with the 1.1 million future residents in New York City? Uh, I know that when I most recently entered Houston, I went on a three-month listen and learn tour where I went into neighborhoods and listened to parents. Uh, there will be some sort of a listen and learn opportunity here as well. But more than anything, I want to be able to connect with the people. I, again, one chancellor in the field is worth three in the seat. Amen. Just one more point, uh, Bridget. The, look, I understand anyone who says we want input, but I want to remind everyone there's 8.5 million New Yorkers, and they have 8.5 million different opinions. And, you know, you have to be honest about you can seek a lot of input, but in the end, because of mayoral control education, I'm responsible for the well-being of 1.1 million kids. I have to make a decision. And I'm not going to make the best decision by crowdsourcing it. I'm going to make the best decision by using my experience and my values and talking to people who I have come to trust over time to get their insights and choose a chancellor who I think can do the whole job. And it's a really, really tough job, extraordinarily complex job. You know, uh, I saw this in Carmen Farina, that she had the whole package. And we've all seen that play out for four years. And that certainly informed the way I went about this approach as well. So I, I get why people say we want input, but I want people to think about that. If everybody wants input, where does that lead to? There's no way to square all the different views, all the different philosophies. Ultimately, we have mayoral control for a reason, and I have to decide, and I have to take on that responsibility for the people. Go ahead, Juliet. Since you were speaking about the arts and you play mariachi music, what role does that play in your professional life and in the life of students that you've been involved in the district? Great question. So in my personal life, it's, it's uh, as we sit here answering questions, I have a, a song going through my head. 
right? They, they, it's a narrative. Um, so it, it tends to calm me. It, it tends to invigorate me. It's, it's one of the passions that Monique and I share uh, is music. Uh, and it's not just mariachi music, but more than that, I think uh, as, as a newly minted bilingual social studies teacher in Tucson, Arizona, when I got to the school that I taught in, I realized that there was an absence of arts in the school, culturally relevant arts. Uh, so I also started a, a youth mariachi program in that school. And I'll tell you why that was important. By the way, it still is in existence today. Over 25 years later, it's still in existence. But the reason that was so important was not to produce professional mariachi musicians. The whole point was to get students to understand that, do you like, by the way, do you like wearing that, un that, that uniform, that costume? Oh, yeah, we love it. Do you like going and performing in places that you've never been? Oh, we love it. Then the price of admission is that you must be eligible. You must not have any academic disciplinary issues. And by the way, when we would go out and perform, any our honorarium that we had would be put into a scholarship fund. So when students graduated, they had a modest but college scholarship to go on. Uh, our graduation rates were almost 100%. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have kids that dropped out because they had something, you know, it's important. It's important for students to read and to write, but it's also important for students to read and write about something. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the arts is what gave them that passion. So I'm a big believer in that. And, and I'll tell you, you know, in college where, you know, you're making ends meet, and while some of my colleagues, you know, were flipping burgers or valeting cars, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, I got to put on my mariachi traje and go play at a wedding or go play at a, a quinceañera and and gig my way through college. Um, so there are, there are some intrinsic benefits, and there are also some real practical benefits for students having. We want to urge all New York City public school students to gig their way through college. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a new phrase we'll be using. Go ahead, Rich. So, um, I wonder if we could take you back to the last Wednesday and Thursday, when you got the one call that you, you weren't being quite picked. But then did you hear about uh, the Miami 180? Uh, before you got the phone call from the mayor, or and, and if so, what was going on in your mind? Beat, beat you to it. Uh, well, yeah, if you, I heard it through Mayor De Blasio. Uh, when uh, you know, I had a day, I have a day job, uh, so uh, uh, so as I, as I was out doing presentations, I had a speaking engagement that day. I was in schools, uh, a number of things, and when I checked my phone after a speaking, one of my speaking engagements, sure enough, I had a, a phone call and a text from Mayor De Blasio, uh, please call me. And when I called him, uh, he broke the news to me, and and of course, uh, we've looked, we've not looked in the rearview mirror ever since. We've only looked ahead. Uh, so uh, you, you were you were breaking news that day, sir. Hey, all things come around. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Carranza, how do you plan to work with the uh, community education councils? To what extent will they be involved in your decision making? And uh, do you think the mayoral control is effective? Well, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting them. I'm looking forward to having a conversation about what the role is and how the role functions. Uh, all of my experience heretofore has been in a in a school board uh, governance environment. This is my first experience with uh, with a, a role that's mayoral control. But uh, so I can't tell you what that's going to look like, or you know whether you know, I can't tell you about it. What I can tell you is that it is uh, it has been so incredibly powerful to be able to sit at a table and talk shop and talk philosophy and talk about educating students uh, with the person who is going to hire you and who, the person whose broader agenda this is a major part of and to have synergy uh, for me just eliminates a lot of the need I think uh, to kind of navigate uh, some of the other politics that sometimes happens. I'm extremely excited about this. I'm extremely excited about what's happening in New York. Uh, and I am uh, just really excited about kicking the tires on this new relationship and seeing how much we, how far we can go down the road. Amen. Amen. Who has not gone yet? Anyone not gone yet? Christina. Who was it? Yes. Hi, um, New York City has, I think, about 100,000 um, homeless students. Um, I'd love to hear about your work in Houston and your thoughts about how to best serve them. Great, thank you. So, obviously, homeless students are, are one of the categories of students that are um, at-risk students, and we know that 
it, if you look at it in any urban environment, you're going to have issues that are particularly exacerbated in an urban environment. Issues of intergenerational poverty, issues of food deserts, issues of uh, incarceration, I issues issues of homelessness. So in every one of those cases, um, in particular with homeless students, um, I'm really excited about the community schools approach that is uh, blossoming here as part of the movement around Thrive in New York, where you can connect students and families with resources that exist in the communities. Uh, I know that, I don't know the exact number, but I do know that New York probably per capita has the greatest number of community-based organizations and effective community-based organizations. So if we create an environment and an infrastructure where we're able to connect homeless students in particular with uh, those organizations that can provide uh, not only housing, but can provide uh, training, can provide uh, meals, can provide um, substance for those families, then, I th then we can actually solidify that family unit and help them be successful. Uh, most recently in, in Houston, um, I had a tremendous experience, and unfortunately we're still going through that as a result of Hurricane Harvey. Imagine an entire city where you have swaths of neighborhoods where every single house now uh, has been destroyed. There's not a single house left. Uh, and where do those families go and where do those students go and how do those students get supported? Uh, on top of the fact that they've undergone trauma, so how do we support them to work through the trauma that they've experienced? Uh, it's given me a whole other level of really trauma-informed supports for homeless students. Uh, I know that uh, Chancellor Farina and I know that uh, the city of New York uh, has done incredible work around providing that kind of support system. And I know Chancellor Farina's uh, team has been very involved with that. I look forward to learning more. Uh, but it is definitely one of those issues which I think we, we, can, we have to pay attention to. I also want to say I know the question was asked in very good faith. I just want to clarify because I think the, the phrase may be a little misleading. We have a, a huge and real problem in terms of uh, young people who are in our shelter system. That is fewer than half of the number you talked about. The, the remaining is families that are doubled up, tripled up, uh, insecure housing, things that are very real and very pertinent, but I don't want people to have the impression that that's the number of kids in shelter because it's a, a very different number. Okay, who has not gone yet? Anyone not gone? Want to give one chance? Okay, let's go for round two. Okay, way back. Chancellor, I'm wondering, um, you know, while there have been sort of steady gains in, in reading and math scores and the graduation rate has steadily ticked up, do you have a, a philosophy about making more rapid change? Is there a way to take, uh, that, that in your experience, to take chronically, quote unquote, underperforming schools and improve them more quickly? So, uh, you know, I think one of the things we have to keep in mind that is that there is no magic bullet. Uh, there's 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 no program. There's no uh, canned program. It, it all goes back to rolling up your sleeves and being very attentive to keeping the work the work, and the work always is students at the center. Uh, our approach, uh, which I'm really excited about, what I've read about the renewal schools and what's happening with renewal schools. Uh, what I would say is that if, in my experience, if you really want to create conditions for historically underserved schools in historically underserved communities to accelerate, you have to pay attention to six things. And I could give you the research base, but Tony Breich has written a lot about this. Doug Reeves has written a, a tremendous amount about this as well. But there are six things that you must pay attention to. Number one, you must pay attention to the leadership in the school. Uh, and the leader must have the capacity to lead the change and create the environment uh, that you want. So leadership is important. The second uh, characteristic or the second bucket of work you have to pay attention to is teaching. So who are the teachers and how are the teachers being supported to build capacity? And if you think about how we talk about uh, accountability in America, especially in some of the movements that get a lot of uh, press, we talk about it's all about accountability. How are we going to hold ourselves accountability? But rarely do we talk about building capacity for what you want to accomplish? Because if you build capacity, accountability will come.
So teaching and teachers are very, very important. My philosophy is I want teachers that want to be at that school with those children, not necessarily teachers that long for the children they used to have or long for the children they wish they could have had. I want students, I want teachers to work with the students that they have and want them, I want them to love them and I want them to push them and I want them to make sure they're going to, they're going to keep them moving uh, forward. The third bucket is your curriculum. So what is the curriculum? Now I love dinosaurs, but I don't want to. I don't want to have a dinosaur lesson in you know all five grade levels, right? So you have to look at your curriculum. What are you teaching? Why are you teaching it? Is it aligned to the standards? And then how do you know that students are actually mastering what uh, they're supposed to be mastering? The fourth thing is how do you organize your school? So is your school organized for instructional press? So it is are things purposeful? Uh, are things joyful? Now here's a concept. Watch out. Is learning joyful in a school? And there seems to be this notion that if it's academic press and if it's really rigorous, it can't be joyful. I disagree. The student that's building a robot is going to have a lot of joy, but it's still going to be rigorous if you want to make that robot do what you want it to do. So how is the school organized to really have joyful learning that's rigorous? The fifth is critical. Wraparound services, social emotional support. It's critical. Because we know that students and families don't always have uh, the conditions that are ideal. So when you don't have those conditions, I'm not asking teachers to be the social worker and I'm not asking teachers to be the mental health experts, but teachers should know that there is a way when they've identified some triggers, they've identified some evidence that a student may have some needs, who can they connect with to get resources to serve that student and in some cases the family. Uh, social emotional learning is critically important. In San Francisco, it's how we were able to reduce our, our suspension rate by over 50% once we put our mind to it. So that's important. That exists in New York City's public schools. Uh, restorative practices as part of a restorative justice approach. Uh, so that's the fifth and that's critical. And then the sixth, is not going to be a surprise to you, parent empowerment. Now, I will say to you right now, I'm not an advocate of parent engagement alone. And some of you may say, what do you mean? You know, you don't believe in engaging parents. It's an awfully low bar. We can all engage parents, have the parent, have the student not get into that after school program that they want to get in. I guarantee you the parent will be engaged. Uh, have a, a student not get into a specialty <laughs> program. I guarantee you the parent will be engaged. Engagement is a very low bar. But when you empower parents, how do we empower parents to be advocates for their children? Because we know that there are parents that who are advocates for their children. Those, those children get what they need. So do parents know what they should be talking to teachers at parent-teacher conference night? Do parents know what their child should know at the end of this school year or at the end of this semester or at the end of the at the end of the unit. Do parents know how to access information to make good decisions for their children? Knowledge is power, empowerment's important. So when you look at all six of those buckets of work, in my experience, you can provide the infrastructure for schools to accelerate, particularly schools in historically underserved communities and in historically underserved environments. Well, I want to add also a very simple point. The, when you think about what we've been trying to do with renewals, um, what Richard did in San Francisco, um, some of the same concepts that we've applied, but he's had tremendous uh, success there. And I want to say this is a, an exciting part of this equation. I think he figured out how to do some things with some uh, schools that were really troubled in San Francisco, turn them around, not only make them better, but make them schools that, as you said, ended up with you know, schools that used to be uh, such that a lot of parents didn't want to go near them. And then within a number of just a few years, uh, these were schools that had a wait list uh, for kids uh, to get into them. So it's really great that uh, Richard has had experience on that particular challenge. Now, let's face it, it's a much bigger scale here, um, and that's that's one of the things that Chancellor Farina and I always uh, had to deal with, was we're trying to deal with a lot of things simultaneously. But the model in San Francisco is one I think we can learn a lot from. Okay, Aaron. Can you tell us what you're planning to do about the ban on plastic bags? Are you yeah, I'd really like to just talk about the new chancellor today, and I'll be talking to you guys the next day or two on everything else. Go ahead. You alluded to a movement that gets a lot of press. I'm assuming you're talking about school, school reform. Could it be? Could it be? <laughs> uh, charter school movement. I have
have some sense that you know you've called for charters to serve all kids, which is certainly what you're talking about here, but New York City has a quite a large and, and politically influential charter school sector, the mayor has had plenty of encounters with. How are you planning to approach that sector? So, so I think we talk about the wrong things. So, um, you know, the, the issue, are you pro-charter, are you anti-charter? You know, I'm pro really good schools. And I've seen uh, traditional public schools that have done a great job educating kids. I've seen some charter schools that have done a great job at educating kids and vice versa. I've seen uh, traditional public schools that have not served kids well and charters that have not served kids well. So I think if we stop following the red, you know, going for the red herring and actually talk about, you know, peel the onion, what are we talking about? We're talking about children. Uh, so when you talk about children and how do you provide great experiences for children, um, I think then you have a platform upon which you can have conversations uh, that directly relate back to empowering children and communities. That being said, I am a vocal, voracious, absolutely passionate supporter of public schools. Why? Because when, think about my parents who were both bilingual, by the way, the English, Spanish, uh, they were first generation. They made a conscious decision that they would teach their two children only Spanish at home. And they trusted that when they sent their children, their mijitos, to the public school system, that the public schools would teach them English and that they would become bilingual. Think of the faith that those parents put in the hands of the public schools uh, and that the faith was actually realized. That's why I'm such a, a supporter of public schools. And I think that, you know, we can do really well. And I think in New York City with 1800 schools, uh, there is a, a, a plethora of incredible schools that are doing well by kids. Amen. Amen. Okay, Willie. You were in Houston just about a year and a half. A lot of plans uh, begun there, but not uh, finished. What do you say to the kids and the parents and the teachers there uh, about that? And what would you say to parents in New York who wonder if you're a guy who follows through, even that you're leaving there so quickly? Yes, so I spent, uh, great question, so I spent, um, you know, close to, what, 15, 16 years in Arizona, I spent another six years in Las Vegas, seven years in San Francisco, and, and yes, a year and a half in um, Houston, uh, although I didn't know that uh, Chancellor Farina was going to want to retire, but, you know, so that was beyond my control. So I'm not, I'm not a school district jumper. I, I spend time in the places that I've been, uh, but every single step of my career, I've been in urban environments. Uh, so when I left the classroom where I served 30 students because I wanted to have a bigger impact, uh, I became a high school principal so I could have an impact on a school. And then as a high school principal, I said, well, I'd like to have a bigger impact and serve more kids. I became a region superintendent now with 68,000 kids that I could impact. And then as a deputy, well, now I have, you know, the same number. And then as a superintendent in Houston, 215,000. And, and I have to tell you, the opportunity to now serve 1.1 million students is unlike any opportunity that exists anywhere in the world in the education. There is no other New York City public schools. So for that reason, uh, and because of the fact that you know, the, the, the agenda for education here in New York is so closely aligned to my professional, personal agenda as well. Uh, it was an opportunity that I could not say no to. My commitment to the mayor has been, uh, as I mentioned, my, my word is my bond, and we shook hands, and uh, because we're so aligned, I'm going to be in New York City uh, as long as you will have me. Uh, but while I'm in New York City, not going to shy away from asking the tough questions, not going to shy away from being very clear that we're going to serve all of our students. Yeah. David. Uh, quick questions. Given how aligned uh, Mr. Gonza seems with um, the sort of worldview of the current chancellor and, and your own, why was he your number two? Again, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details. The bottom line is it was a very, very close call. I feel great about how things have come together in the end. And uh, we learn things even in these dynamics. We learn things about what people really believe and what they're committed to. And here's a guy who's proven through his actions he's committed to the kids in New York City. And I have to say the conversations this weekend were outstanding and gave us both, I think, tremendous faith in each other. So we're looking to the future. The second small question, you mentioned that your, your wife has come to the city more than you have. I wonder just what she does for a living or if you want to answer. Well, I would I would never presume to speak for her, so I'm going to answer. 
Um, my sister Susie is a professional mariachi and she owns an entertainment company in Los Angeles. And so we've come here for the past five years to the APAP conference, the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Um, so we did that every year. And I also have um, my junior high best friend, who's still my junior, still my best friend to this day, has lived in um, New York for, I believe, about since we graduated from college, so about 22 to 25 years. Um, and she's lived in, she lived in Brooklyn. She just recently moved back to Los Angeles. Yes. Um, I read a bit that you often were um, described as wanting to centralize power in the central office in Houston as opposed to leaving it with principles. Is that something you plan to do here, is uh, take some of the decision making from the principles? Well, can I just start sure. and say, we, over these last four years, and I want to thank Chancellor Farina for this, you know, we, as you may remember, we, we had a previous life together on a local school board and then uh, watched with some dismay uh, the way things were handled in the previous administration and the fact that um, a lot of what worked about having a clear central strategy as a city was being lost and certainly the power of having leadership at the district level was being uh, reduced. And we, from the beginning, this is one of the conversations I remember very vividly early on, we said we're going to correct this. So we have done a lot, not only to enhance the role of the chancellor and the ability of uh, the Department of Education to create standards that are applied across the entire city consistently, uh, but also to have strong district superintendents and to reiterate that role uh, as a crucial piece of the equation. So that's been going on for four years. Uh, we fully intend to continue that. So really fair question. So again, it's a work in progress in Houston. Houston ha went to a decentralized model uh, back in the 19, late 1990s. Uh, and remember, I've been a principal. I've been a principal in two different schools in two different states. So I tremendously have faith that principals uh, can make great decisions at the local level. Uh, and the caveat is if we provide the support, if we provide the training, and if we are clear about what is within the realm of local decision making and what is not within the realm of local decision making. Um, so the situation in Houston, and again, I'm not going to bore you with all of the details, but I will say that the decentralization ha has, from my very humble opinion, run amok. There are no guardrails. So everything being decentralized, you become then a confederation of independent schools rather than a unified school system. Uh, and there are some things that you cannot just de decentralize. So you need to have some central direction. I'll give you some examples. As we talk about social emotional learning, that is something that there is a role for a, a, a site-based uh, decision-making process. Who are your partners? What are the needs of your school site, et cetera? But the philosophy, the structure about how we provide community schools is something that can only be empowered when you have a centralized approach to provide those resources to the school sites. Um, that's important. And I would also point out that in a decentralized system, it works well if you have a very well-funded system. In the state of Texas, unfortunately, it's not a well-funded system. In that school district, uh, we started uh, January with a $206 million cut to the budget, uh, which is 10% of that operating budget. It's now whittled down to a mere $115 million. And by the way, that school district, Houston Independent School District, still has to write a check back to the state of Texas for $238 million. So we'll get into, uh, actually, I want to forget about that, um, uh, <laughs> school finance in Texas. But I will say there are some um, systemic issues that make it unconscionable not to be very clear and 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 strategic about how you invest your resources. Okay, we're going to two more on DOE. Have you got them? Going once. Oh, yes, please. So it's going to be your baseball cap on opening day. Houston, Ooh. San Francisco, Mets. Phoenix. This is a complex situation. This has been thoroughly vetted. <laughs> there are a lot of deep conversations. Okay, we're watching you, Richard. Okay. So uh, I love baseball. That's a good. We'll stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That was the question. We already are working on that question, but I'd prefer if he didn't go any further into it. He started, let me tell you, I'm going to start, I'm going to start the story because it started in a very promising manner. Because, you know, I'm thinking of oh, the guys from the West Coast, you know, or the West, I should say, and this is, this is going to be great. There's not going to be a problem here. So he starts out by saying in Tucson, the minor league team was affiliated with the Oakland Athletics. 
So I'm thinking Oakland Athletics, they're fine, no problem, we don't have a conflict here. Then it got worse. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. So it got worse because my, my father's um, – my father's favorite baseball team were the New York Yankees, the Pinstripes, and his favorite player, his favorite players were Joe DiMaggio and Lou Gehrig. Uh, so growing up, my my dad there was a lot of Pinstripes in the house. Um, but then he cheated on the Yankees, and then developed a love for the Dodgers when Fernando Valenzuela was pitching for the Dodgers. Okay. So for a while there, we were <laughs> Dodgers fans, uh, and then obviously living in Houston, I was cheering those Astros. Uh, and, um, and then I happened to marry my wife, who is a diehard Dodger fan. So. The Dodger thing's okay. Let's stay with that. Dodgers okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Last call. Go ahead. I'm wondering what kind of say and control over deputy chancellors and top staff uh, the new chancellor is going to have. How did you hash that out in your, in your discussion? We've had great conversations. Um, just like I experienced with Chancellor Farina, you know, we would talk stuff through. Look, it depend on the chancellor, the head of any agency, to figure out the right team and to figure out the right way of taking the ideas, taking the big concepts and applying them. We do talk about senior personnel, it makes sense to do, but ultimately you got to have a team that you feel good about. So the chancellor has to ultimately put together a team that he feels confident in. Thanks, everyone.